Welcome to Peter Caffrey's Fucked Up Bedtime Stories number four, Pork Chop. With Kitty Cat gone, Arnold decides he wouldn't mind a new pet, and he's got his heart set on getting a dog. Jimmy the Chimp, however, doesn't agree and tries to point out that dog ownership comes with responsibilities, like feeding the thing, taking it out for a walk, and picking up its shit. However, he changes his mind and formulates a plan when they meet Pork Chop, a guide dog who fucking hates the blind. And why wouldn't he? The white stick carrying bastards. So, enjoy your bedtime story. Peter Caffrey's Fucked Up Bedtime Stories, number four, Pork Chop. Check it out, Jimmy the Chimp said with excitement, nudging Arnold awake. Sitting up in bed, blinking, Arnold tried to focus on Mummy as she leaned over him. She's wearing skin-tight lycra, Jimmy whimpered. I think I'm going to explode. What's happening, Mummy? Arnold asked, unsure what time it was. I'm off to do a park run, she said, her voice soothing. Do you want to come and get some fresh air? Arnold shook his head, allowing his sleepy eyes to close. Say we'll go, Jimmy snapped. There'll be loads of mummies, all in lycra, running with the freedom of gazelles. It'll be a cornucopia of buttocks and tits and camel toes. Arnold opened one eye to check mummy had left the bedroom before he replied. It'll be boring, fat women running round in circles. Why would you want to see that? One reason, Jimmy said, revelling in being able to impart knowledge to his less worldly friend. Mummy will be there, in lycra, getting hot and sweaty. Anyway, these are women who run. I doubt many will be fat. But we can stay in bed and watch cartoons, Arnold argued. If you're desperate to see women in lycra, we can watch the Zumba video where Mummy and Daddy are out. It's Mummy, in fucking lycra, Jimmy screamed. Mummy popped her head around the bedroom door. For a second, Arnold panicked, before remembering nobody else could hear Jimmy's voice. Arnold, Mummy whispered, if you're not coming with me, please get up and help Daddy mow the lawn while I'm out. Wait for me, Mummy, Arnold yelled, struggling from the bed and pulling on his clothes. (coughs) The car park was busy despite the bleak, drizzly early morning start. Although there was a good mix of different demographics, the vast majority of attendees were middle-aged women dressed in various gaudy hues of lycra. Contrary to Jimmy's expectations, a significant proportion of them were overweight. Many flexed and stretched as they chatted, while others gripped disposable coffee cups. Following Mummy towards the start line, Arnold muttered, There's a lot of dogs here. Oh, Arnold, Jimmy chided. For someone who's only ever your mum has in act, you're very judgmental. Take it from me. There's much more to most of these women than meets the eye. No, Arnold said, pointing towards the crowd. There are a lot of dogs, real dogs. It was true. Many people had dogs with them, most fitted with harnesses, which were strapped to the runners' waists. That's cheating, Jimmy sneered. I could run this easily if some fucking huge hound was dragging me around. (laughs) Arnold giggled. He liked dogs. Since the slaughter of Kitty Cat, he'd missed having a pet. Maybe he should ask Mummy if they could get a dog. I know what you're thinking, Jimmy muttered. Don't even consider it. Why? Arnold asked sulkily. Dogs are hard work. You need to take them out for walks several times a day. You need to pick up their shit. They chew everything to bits and they dry up your legs, your cushions, your friends. A pretty boy like me won't stand a chance if you have some horny terrier in the house. I could train it, Arnold argued. You can't train yourself not to dry up the furniture. Forget it. The crowd moved to the start line. Mummy turned and waved, and then they were off, trundling down the path and out of sight. There might be a way to enjoy a dog without any of the hard work, Jimmy mused. Arnold looked excited, his eyes pleading with Jimmy to find a solution. If we make friends with a dog, we could play with it, and its owner could do all the hard work and pay for its food. All we'd have to do was train them up to respond to us when we wanted to play. How do we do that? Arnold asked. Well, Jimmy said, musing over the options. I could use my powers to have a word and see if the dog was interested in new playmates. If it was, it'd be quite easy to pull off. Arnold clapped his hands to display his excitement at the idea. Jimmy shook his head. Don't do that, Arnold, he snapped. You look like a fucking... 
Oh, yep. While most of the dogs had set off with the runners, one, wearing a complex harness, waited at the start line. Arnold nodded towards it. What about him? Who? Jimmy asked. Oh, pork chop over there. Arnold was surprised by Jimmy's response. Do you know him? Jimmy shook his head. If you don't know him, how do you know his name? He looks like he enjoys a pork chop, doesn't he? <laughs> Arnold giggled. As usual, Jimmy was right. He always seemed to be right about these things. The golden Labrador looked every inch as if his name was Porkchop. Making their way over, Arnold sat Jimmy on the floor before patting the dog. Hello, Porkchop, he said. You're a good boy, aren't you? Porkchop looked at Jimmy. Why is your owner calling me Porkchop? the dog asked. We guessed it was your name, Jimmy explained. You look like you'd enjoy a nice pork chop. My name's Terry, Porkchop muttered. Is that your real name, or what your owner calls you? It's what she calls me. So what's your real name? Jimmy asked. I'm fucked if I know. I guess pork chop's as good as any name. I'm Jimmy, by the way. Porkchop grinned. I'm guessing that's not your real name. No, my real name is... His most satanic majesty, Felonius the 18th, defiler of virgins and consumer of bananas. That's a name to be proud of, Porkchop said with a laugh. It is indeed, Jimmy agreed. How come you're not running? She never runs with me, Porkchop said with disgust. It's not within the confines of what she calls our working relationship. Dull and ordinary tasks, shitty jobs, the mundane, they're all acceptable fare for good old Terry. Anything interesting is off the cards. She says it's not right and fitting for me to have fun. She sounds like an arsehole, Jimmy said. So, you've met her before, Porkchop laughed. As the two chatted, the runners made their way past for the second lap. Jimmy pointed out Mummy. See her, the one with the decent knockers and the tight ass. She's ours. Very nice too, Porkchop muttered. Here comes mine, the one on the end of the leash. Jimmy laughed at what he assumed was a joke, but as the woman passed, he did a double take. Sure enough, the miserable-faced owner was running while clutching a long fluorescent green leash, which was held at the other end by a grinning idiot of a man. She's a bit of a poser, Jimmy said. She's wearing sunglasses on a cloudy day, for fuck's sake. Oh, they're all the same. They're all self-centred. Everything's about them, not the dog. They won't let you play. They won't let kids feed you biscuits. They won't let strangers rub your belly. But they'll happily use you to make sure they get a seat on the train or to get to the front of the queue in the supermarket. In truth, Jimmy, I fucking hate the blind. Back at home, Jimmy waited till they were upstairs before telling Arnold all about his conversation with Paul Chop. Realising he was a guide dog, Arnold's face fell. We won't be allowed to play with him. Don't be so hasty, Jimmy said with enthusiasm. Paul Chop is pissed off because no one plays with him. He hates the fact no one pets him or feeds him treats or takes him on adventures. He wants to be our friend. And because his owner, Mrs Bromine, is blind, she won't be able to see what we're doing. Arnold picked through a bag of fizzy snakes, dropping a few into his sticky mouth. If we ask if she'll let us take Porkchop out to play... We won't ask, Jimmy exclaimed, trying to underline his point to Arnold. So long as Porkchop is there to take Mrs Bromine to the shops, or to work, or wherever she needs to go, that's all she expects. Once she's where she wants to be, then poor old Porkchop becomes an encumbrance. Mrs Bromine wants him out of the way until it's time for her to go somewhere else. If anything, it makes Porkchop an ideal candidate to be our part-time dog. Normally, the logistics involved in repeatedly kidnapping a dog when he's not needed, only to return him when he is, would be a nightmare, Jimmy continued. However, we've got a huge advantage. We can liaise with Paul Chop himself. Arnold didn't respond. Instead, he kept chewing on the fizzy snakes, sucking down the sour juice as he contemplated the plan. It seemed more like the adventure revolved around Jimmy and Paul Chop. He had a smaller part to play, and at the park run, it had been Jimmy and Paul Chop doing all the talking. Arnold had originally suggested getting a dog, but it felt as if he would only be a spare part in the friendship. Clambering off the bed, he muttered, not sure I want a dog anymore. Stop whining, Jimmy said. What does it matter? Paul Chop's your friend, not mine. Okay, Arnold, you need to grow up a bit. If you're going to act like a moody cunt, I'll cancel our adventures. Jimmy's tone indicated the chimp had reached the end of his tether. What adventures? Arnold asked, afraid he might miss out on an escapade. Tomorrow morning, Paul Chop takes Mrs Bromine to church at nine o'clock. She goes to the one on the other side of the park. He'll bring her home just before ten. We'll wait in the park and create a noisy diversion to freak her out. Paul Chop can make a break for it, and once they've separated, that's where you come in. You tell Mrs Bromine a bunch of yobs were chasing her dog, but you've seen them off. Then you take her home, help her inside, and tell her you'll find her guide dog. 
We can play with Paul Chop for the rest of the day, and when you take him back, you might even get a reward. Arnold hesitated in the doorway, his hand resting on the doorknob. He wanted to play with Paul Chop, but he also wanted Jimmy to understand he was a more important friend than a scruffy hound. I don't know, he whined. Christ on a fucking moped, Jimmy spat. One minute you want a dog, then you don't. I wish you'd make your mind up. I'm going to get some chocolate, Arnold muttered. Do you want to have an adventure later this afternoon? It might be better if you use the time to work out what you want, Jimmy said curtly, before picking up Mummy's mail order catalogue and leafing through to the laundry section. <laughs> the morning air was cold and crisp and the park was empty. Arnold and Jimmy huddled on a bench next to the main path. At around ten minutes to nine, Mrs Bromine appeared at the top of the park, Paul Chop leading her along. OK, Jimmy muttered. Let her go past. If we're not snatching pork chop until later, why do we need to get up so early? Arnold asked, a sulky whine evident in his tone. Planning, Jimmy snapped. As the blind woman approached the bench, Jimmy raised his paw and pork chop winked in return. Arnold, unable to sit still, leaned forwards and patted the dog. Hello, doggy, he chuckled. Mrs. Bromine took a firm grip of pork chop's harness and yanked the dog away. <laughs> Don't pet him, she snapped. He's a working guide dog and doesn't want to be touched. Whoever is the parent of this child, you should be ashamed for raising such an ill-mannered brat. Now move aside. Mrs. Bromine picked up her pace and the pair walked away, heading towards the church. Jimmy and Arnold sat looking at each other, knowing grins on their faces. Jimmy suggested killing time by heading over to the tennis courts to watch the girls have their lessons, but Arnold's nerves had increased. Mrs. Bromine wasn't going to be a pushover. She'd fight against them taking pork chop, and if she got hold of them, she'd call the police. He could be arrested for dog napping. Telling Jimmy about his concerns would only lead to a tirade of abuse, so he stayed silent as they waited. The first few people leaving the church walked briskly through the park. Watching the gates, Arnold prayed Mrs. Bromine would be with someone. If she was, they'd have to abandon the plan. Unfortunately, when she appeared, she was alone. As she approached, Jimmy repeated the plan. When he got to the part where Arnold talked to Mrs. Bromine, the boy interjected. You saw how she reacted when I petted Paul Chop. What makes you think she'll talk to me after we've caused the chaos? She'll be confused, vulnerable. She'll need someone to help her. And who's less threatening than a little boy? Now shut up and let's do this. As Paul Chop and Mrs. Bromine passed by, Arnold moved out wide before running towards them. As he did, he bounced the tennis ball on the path as hard as he could and shouted, Fetch, boy! Jimmy gave instructions to Paul Chop, who quickened his pace and started to growl. Who's there? Mrs. Bromine asked, a tremor in her voice. Please move away. I'm blind. Arnold had doubled back and ran past the blind woman, making a crazed barking sound. Pork Chop barked too, and as Arnold turned again, he shouted, Get out of here, you dirty mutt. Jimmy gave more instructions to Pork Chop, who started to run while barking loudly. Unable to restrain the dog, but refusing to let go of his harness, Mrs. Bromine was dragged towards the exit from the park. Jimmy rose up in the air, his voice changing to a demonic growl as he made a satanic utterance. In response, from the back gardens of the houses surrounding the alleyway, other dogs started to bark and howl, a cacophony of hellish intensity. Yaroslav Hoydaka was happy for the first time in nearly two years. All he cared about was his family, his beautiful, although somewhat dumpling-like wife Svitlanka, his intelligent and bright-eyed daughter Rostinka, and Furman, his strong but female-minded son. He'd always worked hard, sometimes being away from home for weeks on end, to give them all the things he never had as a child. The best rates of pay for lorry driving were in the UK, and although far from home, the job had served him well until the recent situation arose. Covid-19 and Brexit forced him to return to Slovakia. Unable to find work, he'd spent his time selling firewood door to door. But that was then, and today was today. He'd been given a visa because of the supply line shortage and the company he worked for had provided him with a nice lorry. He liked it a lot. Down both sides it was decorated with a stylized painting of bright red tomatoes, fresh and plump on the vine. These were draped across a wooden cutting board and surrounded by bundles of herbs. He loved driving the lorry. Everybody was happy to see it pass by, adorned with images of simple, fresh, nutritious food. The road ahead was clear, so Yaroslav reached out a finger and touched the screen on his phone. 
He didn't want to make a call or check messages, he just wanted to see the lock screen and its photo of his wife and children. It had been taken by a tour guide at the Tractor Museum in his hometown on the day he received confirmation of his visa to work in the UK again. Yaroslav only glanced at the picture, but when he looked up it was too late to react as a golden dog came racing out of an alleyway, dragging behind it what appeared to be a large bundle of rags. Paul Chop was moving at a fair old lick when he reached the exit from the park. Mrs Bromine was still on her feet, but out of control, staggering to keep up with the galloping hound. Jimmy shook his head. He'd overdone the chaos, but the plan could still work. As Paul Chop reached the street, he executed a sharp left turn. With his claws scrabbling at the pavement, he managed to retain some grip and accelerated towards home. Dragged in his wake, Mrs Bromine raced through a perfect parabola, her legs whirring with little ground contact. As her arcing body crossed the curb, a tyre bigger than her entire frame chewed her up, squashing her into a mess of blood, gore, shattered bones and shit. For a moment, Paul Chop raced on the spot before the huge wheel tightened his harness and reeled him in, crushing him into a substance resembling strawberry jam and hamburger. The morning air was split by the hissing shriek of air brakes, then it went quiet. Arnold and Jimmy reached the street and, pausing, stared at the articulated lorry decorated with its rustic design of tomatoes and herbs. Glancing up and down the road, there was no sign of Pulp Chop or Mrs Bromine. Where had they gone? A few seconds later, Yaroslav edged around the front of the lorry, peering in terror at the wheel. Following his gaze, Arnold saw a puddle of what appeared to be bloody diarrhoea and munched flesh mixed with rags and shards of bone. It happened too fast, Jaroslav wailed. No could stop. The realisation hit Arnold, his stomach cramping, his head spinning. If he'd had any breakfast, it would have been splattered on the pavement. Instead, he dry heaved. I think that mess is Paul Chop and Mrs Bromine, he whispered to the chimp. I know, Jimmy replied. I'm not sure whether to cry or have a wank. Jaroslav was on his knees, weeping. The passing car stopped and the driver got out. On investigating, he dashed back to his car to retrieve his phone. As he made the emergency call, he vomited. Let's go home, Arnold muttered, his face devoid of any colour. What? And leave Pop Chop here? He's no good to us now. Sorry, kid, Jimmy said. But after all our efforts, I think we deserve to get at least one adventure out of him. If you distract him, I use my powers to raise him up. How can I distract him? Arnold asked. Tell him you saw the accident. Act traumatised. Start crying like a bitch. You know how to do that. Just ensure you're long gone before the police arrive. I'll see you back at home. Arnold went over to the lorry and talked to the men. As they consoled him, Jimmy rose into the air, slowly revolving, his arms outstretched. An angry sound split the darkening morning. To Yaroslav and the passing motorist, it sounded like a clap of thunder. To Arnold, it sounded like Jimmy's serious voice, screaming something unintelligible to the skies. Paul Chop only had one functioning eye, but it swivelled and spanned so fast it was hard to tell what he was looking at. The other eye socket was a bloody void, a few tubes and nerves hanging loose. His skull was misshapen, the lorry wheel had well and truly crushed it. Chunks of his face were missing, including the entire left cheek and lip, showing the jagged edge of his broken teeth. If his head was a mess, his body was like the twisted wreckage of a plane crash. A gash down one flank revealed glimpses of his intestines, which were leaking gloops of blood and wet shit. His legs resembled broken angle poised lamps, wild variations evident at every joint. In short, he was fucked. Arnold shook his head in disappointment. We're not going to have much of an adventure with him, are we? Oh ye of little faith, Jimmy said with a smirk. We're going to have a fucking brilliant night out with our old mate Paul Chop. Night? Arnold asked, surprised at Jimmy's declaration. Yes, night, Jimmy replied. With Mrs Bromine dead, there's no rush to get him back, is there? Where are we going? You know, as you head out of town, past the old bus station, there's those derelict warehouses. Well, a bunch of travellers have pitched up there. I know, Arnold said with a shudder. Daddy was moaning about them. We'd better steer clear of the area. Jimmy laughed, a knowing and mocking guffaw. Why would we do that? Think about it. What do travellers love? I don't know, Arnold replied. I'll tell you, Jimmy said. They love to bet on a dogfight. What? Arnold's exclamation was so loud, Jimmy raised his paw to his lips, cautioning him to quieten down. They love a dogfight, and tonight, Sunday night, will be the biggest fight night of the week. If we enter a pork chop, they'll take one look at his sorry state and give us good odds. If we bet big, we'll clean up. What do you think? 
Arnold screwed his face up. How can we bet big? he asked. I've only got a few pennies. It's Sunday, Jimmy said. What does Daddy do every Sunday? He has his bath and then lounges around in that fucking silk kimono trying to give Mummy a flash of his balls. That means his trousers and his wallet are on the floor of their bedroom. All you need to do is empty his wallet and we'll use the cash as stake money. When we win, we can put back what we've taken and keep the rest. Arnold hesitated, his gaze dropping to the floor. But Pork Chop will be ripped to shreds in a fight. If we were talking about the young Pork Chop, I'd agree. But now our boy is a satanic reanimation capable of unspeakable horrors. He'll walk it. For a moment, Arnold fell silent, his only movement a nervous nibbling at his lips. Then he sighed. I'm scared. Oh what? Daddy won't know you took his money. Arnold shook his head. I'm scared of the travellers. Why? I'll be there. Pork Chop will be there. No one will dare touch you. But they steal boys and sell them as slaves. Daddy said so. No, they don't, Jimmy snapped. Now, as soon as Daddy has his bath, get his wallet. Arnold lay on his bed, staring at the ceiling, a feeling of dread closing in on him. Jimmy reclined on the pillow, a mischievous grin on his face as he whistled the refrain from We're in the Money. (laughs) The night air was bitterly cold. Huddled in his school coat, Arnold held Jimmy the Chimp in one hand and led the limping pork chop with the other. Around the traveller's sight, small bonfires burned. Although he couldn't see them, Arnold sensed people watching him from the darkness. Heart hammering against his ribs, limbs trembling and bladder threatening to empty itself at any second, Arnold regretted ever mentioning he wanted a dog. This wasn't an adventure. This was hell. Something moved in the dark, close by. Arnold froze. Keep going, you chicken shit, Jimmy said with scorn. They're not going to hurt you. They will, Arnold mumbled, but with no real other option, he edged forwards. Meandering through the jumble of caravans, Arnold realised that even if he decided to run, he didn't know how to get back to the road. Pork Chop would be of no help. He was a limping, soulless vessel awaiting Jimmy's possession of his cadaver. Turning a corner, someone inside a burnt-out van whistled. It was a derisory wolf whistle, a sign of mockery and contempt. Arnold felt a dribble of hot urine run down his inner thigh. Struggling to hold back the tears, he silently prayed for some sort of intervention. Splitting the darkness, a bright torch beam focused on him. Blinking and turning away, Arnold noticed another light, duller, like a lantern, closing in from the other direction. Everything in his head screamed to run, but Jimmy gave him instructions in a calm, reassuring voice. Be nice, Arnold. Be polite. You're a guest and this is their home. They won't hurt you unless you give them cause to. Trembling with fear, he watched the old man with the lamp approach. The traveller grinned, a single crooked yellow tooth showing between his lips. What have we here? The old man wheezed. A wee chap come a-visiting. Awkward and unsure how to reply, Arnold grinned like a half-wit. How do you do? The man asked, proffering his hand. My name is Charlie Five Teeth. Arnold determined not to ask what happened to his other four teeth. Taking his hand and shaking it, Arnold said, Hello, Mr. Five Teeth. I'm Arnold and this, he nodded towards Pork Chop, is my dog. Charlie lowered the lamp to get a better look at the canine. What happened to him? He had an accident. I dare say he did. The situation was uncomfortable. So Arnold, tell me this. What brings you to our camp on a Sunday evening? Ask if he knows anything about dogs, Jimmy said. Do you know anything about dogs, Mr. Five Teeth? Charlie laughed, his cackle growing in intensity until it became a cough. He hauled up something viscous and spat a lump of phlegm onto the ground. There's some might say I know a good deal about dogs. Another man approached. Who's this, Charlie? He asked with aggression. This is Arnold, Charlie replied. He was asking if I knew anything about dogs. Jesus, what would you know about dogs? The man said. You haven't had a champion in donkey's years. Jimmy muttered an instruction to Arnold, who timidly asked, Do you think my dog could have a go in a dog fight? The two men looked at each other before Charlie leaned in, bringing the lantern close to Arnold's face. Go back the way you came until you reach the road, then go home, little boy. With that, he stood upright, turned and walked away. Once more, Jimmy gave his instructions. Arnold wasn't sure what they meant, but he repeated what he was told. Mr. Five Teeth, if Paul Chop was up against one of your dogs, what odds would you give him? Seventeen to two, Charlie shouted over his shoulder. Once more, Arnold regurgitated what Jimmy told him to say. So if I wagered £90 on pork chop, I'd see a return of £855, including my stake money. The men stopped and turned. Charlie's twitching fingers showed he was doing mental arithmetic. Is there some sort of rain man thing going on here? He asked. 
Is that figure right, Mr. Five Teeth? It is, Charlie said. I'll take those odds, Arnold muttered. But do you have any state money? Arnold pulled the wad of notes from his pocket and held them up. Charlie hawked up another lump of something noxious and spat it into the palm of his hand before holding it out. Arnold stood stock still. Shake his hand, Jimmy said. Arnold didn't move. He wasn't touching a hand with spit on it. Fucking shake it, Jimmy ordered. Arnold's hands remained firmly at his side. Shake it now, or you're on your own. And when they're taking turns... Arnold shook Charlie's hand. The fight ring was illuminated by a bank of sightlights, a spluttering generator barely audible over the drone of voices as the crowd of travellers made bets and argued over potential outcomes. A fat man with a lazy eye climbed onto a large crate and rang a handbell. The crowd hushed. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight's card will commence with a challenge from a visitor to our community. Pork chop, owned by Arnold, will take on Lucifer, owned by Frankie Jawbone. Make your bets, for the fight will commence shortly. Several members of the audience crossed the ring to cast an eye over Porkchop. Most shook their heads, disappointed by what they saw. Did this fella just lose a fight? One asked before laughing. Jesus, another muttered. This one needs putting down. On the other side of the ring, a snarling ball of muscle and teeth was attracting a different level of attention. Many of the travellers high-fived each other, with money changing hands at a rapid pace. Which dog is that? Arnold asked one of the few men eyeing up Paul Chop. That's Lucifer, he replied. Do you fancy your boy's chances? Arnold nodded, but in his guts an uneasy feeling was growing. Had Jimmy got them into a fight they couldn't win? Are all bets placed? The fat man shouted. Clear the ring! This is it, Jimmy muttered, before stretching out his arms and levitating into the night sky. As he did, Paul Chop's eyes came alive, a sparkle appearing where before had been dullness. Arnold led the dog into the ring and, unfastening the leash, held his collar just as the owner of Lucifer did. As the fat man rang his bell again, both released their hounds. Lucifer flew across the ring, his jaws snapping on the punk chop's front leg. Despite the deafening cheers and whoops from the crowd, the sound of cracking bone was still obvious. Despite the damage, Pork Chop didn't react. Lucifer opened his jaw again and tried to lock on Pork Chop's face, but the Labrador came alive, twisting away and in turn biting hard on Lucifer's shoulder. With unexpected strength, he flipped the muscular dog over, smashing him onto the ground. For a second, Lucifer was stunned, the wind knocked out of him, and in that moment, Pork Chop sank his teeth into his adversary's belly and tore the flesh open. A piercing howl filled the air as Lucifer's intestines were exposed, his guts steaming in the cold night air. After his legs twitched a few times, he was still. A hush fell over the crowd as they tried to absorb what they'd witnessed. The fight had lasted less than 15 seconds, with the fragile, tattered newcomer easily dispatching his opponent. Arnold led Pork Chop from the ring, Jimmy descended and the dog fell back into a stupor. As Charlie Five Teeth counted out Arnold's winnings, he had a grin on his face. Aren't you upset you lost our bet? Arnold asked. Not at all, Jimmy chuckled. Your bet was the only one I took on Pork Chop. Everyone else bet on Lucifer, so I've cleaned up. Arnold rolled up the handful of banknotes and pushed them into his pocket. Thanks, Mr. Five Teeth. I'd better get off home. So early, Charlie said with surprise. If I were you, wee man, I wouldn't be so hasty. This rabble will want a chance to win back their money. And when people are chasing losses, there's a profit to be made. You could double or even treble your winnings if you stayed. Unsure whether Charlie Five Teeth's words were advice or a threat, Arnold didn't know what to do. I need to talk to... I mean, I need to think about it. You go talk to whoever it is you must, Charlie said with a wink. You know where to find me if you decide to stay. After a brief conversation, Jimmy was adamant they should stay. Arnold found Charlie and handed over the roll of notes, taking odds of two to one. With Pork Chop back in the ring, the fat man returned and announced the contest. Our previous winner is ready to go again, and why not? It was such a short encounter, he's still full of fight. His opponent will be the local hero, challenger for the national crown, an undefeated firebolt of fury, Hercules. The buzz in the crowd was electrifying, people pushing and shoving to try and get their bets on. The majority favoured Hercules, but a fair few were backing Pork Chop. As a number of people came to look his dog over, Arnold's fear subsided, but his positivity was short-lived as Hercules was led into the ring. The beast exuded an air of cocksure malevolence as he strutted in a circle, his muscular frame rippling with each step. Sniffing the air, the hound glared at the crowd before throwing a glance at Pork Chop. Did Hercules smirk? 
Arnold was certain he'd spotted a mocking grin from their opponent, the muck confident he would tear the Labrador to pieces. The fat man climbed onto his crate and rang his bell with urgency. Are all bets placed, he hollered. Prepare for the fight to commence. The crowd hushed. Jimmy the Chimp extended his arms and levitated above the arena. Unhooking Paul Chop's leash, Arnold stepped out of the ring. Hercules tensed, glaring at Paul Chop, then made his move, hunching low and moving in fast. Before Paul Chop could react, the other dog was underneath him, teeth locked onto his flank. Tearing a strip of flesh away, the wound revealed Paul Chop's ribs, his innards pressed up against the bones. The travellers who backed Hercules cheered as their champion inflicted the wound, but Paul Chop didn't flinch. Hercules turned with speed, muscles rippling as his body twisted to change direction, and as he did he sunk his teeth into Paul Chop's shoulder. Using his superior weight, he dragged his opponent down. Arnold looked to the sky, wondering why Jimmy wasn't fighting back, but as he did, Paul Chop spun, his body a blur as he pinned down and mounted the furious hound. Hercules snarled and snapped, powerless to stop the buggery. In front of a shocked crowd, Paul Chop was hammering into his knees with frenzied movements. Unable to resist, the fireball of fury whimpered his defeat. As Paul Chop reached his climax, he leaned forward and sank his teeth into the defeated dog's muzzle. Jerking backwards, he dragged his adversary's head with such force, the crack of Hercules' neck snapping sounded out loud above the hubbub of the crowd. The mood around the ring was volatile, the handful of winners jeering the masses. As tempers boiled over and punches were thrown, the fat man with a lazy eye was up on his crate, ringing the living shit out of his bell, desperate to regain control. Another victory to Pork Chop, he bellowed. But I'm sure many of you want a chance to win back your losses. Is anyone brave enough to take on our visitor? Travellers glanced around to see who would accept the challenge. A number of men with snarling dogs on leashes shook their heads, unwilling to risk their champions in waiting against the wild card hellhound. Will no one take the challenge? The fat man roared. The crowd fell silent. I will, a voice called out the accent differentiating the speaker from the travellers. The crowd parted and a dishevelled man stepped forward. He looked a broken soul and he was without a dog. My name is Jaroslav Hoidaka, the man said, and until today I was gainfully employed as driver of lorry. However, after unfortunate incident, I am out of work and desperate for money to support family. To earn a few coins, I will fight dog. Arnold turned to Jimmy. It's the lorry driver, the one who killed Mrs. Bromine and pulled chop. This could work in our favour, Jimmy said with a grin. Let's see how the betting goes. The overwhelming support was for Pork Chop to beat the man. Jimmy chuckled as the bets were laid. Gesturing to Arnold, he muttered, Wait until the last moment and put all our money on the lorry driver. What? Arnold asked, surprised at the instruction. Pork Chop will tear him to bits. Trust me, Jimmy said with a wink. With the bet placed, Arnold got ready to unleash Pork Chop. As he did, an old crone tugged at his sleeve. I want to place a bet, but I haven't picked up my pension, she muttered, ill-fitting dentures making it sound as if she had a mouthful of spit. Can we come to an arrangement? Arnold shrugged. Maybe I could perform a service for you, she added. Ask if she'll take her teeth out first, Jimmy muttered. Unsure of the reason for the question, Arnold asked, and the crone agreed. Yaroslav, stripped down to his underpants, walked to the middle of the ring and faced Pork Chop, whose eyes burned with fury as Jimmy levitated and took control. The fat man rang his bell and the dog leaped forward, snapping at the lorry driver's neck. In a split second, he torn Yaroslav's throat out. Sinking to his knees, gurgling blood, the Slovakian fell flat on his face. As the crowd exploded with joy, Arnold looked into the dark sky. What had Jimmy done? He'd lost their money. All around him, travellers cheered and whooped, slapping each other's backs. Then a single voice sounded above the hullabaloo. Wait, it's not done yet! As the mob hushed, Arnold turned to see what was happening. Yaroslav struggled to rise, trembling as he got to his knees. Hawk Chop stood watching his efforts. While many in the crowd couldn't see anything different in the dog's appearance, Arnold did. The eyes were dull and lifeless. Jimmy had disconnected and was now reanimating the lorry driver. On his feet, unsteady but maintaining his balance, Yaroslav took a step back, then another, and another. Pausing for a moment, he launched into a runner, and as he reached the dog, he let loose a furious kick. His foot connected with Paul Chop's head, which flew off, spiralling upwards into the night sky. The mood was ugly, travellers remonstrating with a fat man to determine if he'd ended the fight when Yaroslav first fell. A few jostled Charlie Five Teeth, demanding a payout. 
As things teetered on the brink of chaos, the old woman led Arnold away. Concealed behind a caravan, as the sounds of fighting drifted across the camp, I think I'm in love, Arnold said wistfully as he sat on the bed. Jesus Christ, Jimmy muttered. Sometimes, Arnold, I wonder why you're such a cunt. Do you think she's single, old Mrs. No Teeth? It doesn't matter. After the Ferrari tonight, they'll pack up and move on in the morning. But I want to see her again. Jimmy tied. You need to learn not to let your dick write checks your brain can't cash. Tonight was all about the money. Getting a teeth out blowy was just a cherry on the cake. Talking of money, it all got a bit hairy at the end, but Charlie and the fat man had too much to lose if they called the fight in favour of Paul Chop. By the way, I put the 90 quid back in Daddy's wallet and chucked it behind the crapper in the bathroom. He'll think it fell out of his trousers while he was taking a shit. Arnold thought for a moment. What are we going to spend the money on? He asked. I'd quite like a canoe. We're not spending it on anything, Jimmy said with authority. Not yet. How are you going to explain coming home with a fucking canoe to Daddy and Mummy? They'll know you've been up to something. I've stashed the cash, and when the time's right, we'll use it for an adventure. Until then, we play it cool. Arnold snuggled down in the covers. Do you know, Jimmy, thinking about it, I don't think I want the responsibility of having a pet dog. Well, that's a valuable lesson learned, Jimmy replied, a hint of smugness in his response. You've also learned that it's not the size of the dog in a fight that counts, it's the size of the fight in a dog. Arnold nodded. But most importantly, Jimmy continued, you've learned that whilst many a good tune can indeed be played on an old fiddle, you don't want to be taking that fiddle home with you, not when it's nearly 90 years old, lives in a caravan and stinks of piss. Good night, Jimmy, Arnold muttered as he turned over and drifted off to sleep. <coughs> That's your bedtime story. Good night, sleep tight. Pork Chop was written by Peter Caffrey, narrated by Peter Caffrey, and engineered by Peter Caffrey. So if it's shit, you know who to blame. Fucked Up Bedtime Stories are released on the 19th of each month exclusively through the Godless platform in ebook and audio format. If you're not a regular user of godless.com, then what the fuck are you doing with your life?